Hi, everyone. I think everything is okay. <laughs> We've almost had a little disaster beforehand. Uh, one of my programs had an ad Adobe update that wasn't really working, but uh, I seem to have gotten back under control. Thank you everyone for showing up. I see lots of people are in the chat. Glad to see you. Happy New Year. All happy to be in one piece. <laughs> Uh, we are in, so I'm coming to you from Toronto. It has been a nice and quiet season as the world is responding to this latest uh, COVID variant. Uh, life has been very um, quiet. Turn my mic just a bit lower. Okay, so let's just turn that down a bit. Let's just see. I'm just a little bit loud. Brandy's telling me. So the COVID variant has been about and we've just been lying low. We got to see our family, had a very nice holiday, got some downtime. And I'm sure you're all looking for a Mando update. And the good news is Mando has his cast off and with a little not too much of an exception. He's back to about 100%. He was supposed to get his, uh, I call it his vasectomy. He was supposed to uh, be snipped this morning, but unfortunately, somebody at the vet, um, I suspect it was COVID and they are shut for the week. So he has a reprieve for one more month. But uh, I'm very glad that saga in my life is over. I uh, didn't get much time to quilt over the holidays, but um, I'm enjoying this declutter challenge. I'm feeling the, the energy come back with all the stuff that's going out the door. So I hope you're enjoying that too. I am so happy to see everybody from all over, including one of my favorite people, John from Art East. Um, looking forward to the uh, Zoom tomorrow night and finding out what animal is the next one in the trending quilt along. I am a couple of blocks behind, but I hopefully will catch up soon. Uh, we've got somebody from oh, Birmingham, England. Camilla, you're staying up late. Michigan, uh, Kenora, Ontario. Very nice. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, I got to get back to Kansas City, Missouri. There are so many quilters there that, that <laughs> you've got Missouri Star down the street. You've got Angela Walters. I know Tula Pink is in the area. Jackie Gearing used to be there. Barbara Bachman. There's just so much. And uh, not quite an easy drive to Lincoln, Nebraska for the International Quilt Museum, but it's doable. Liza, uh, good to see you here. I believe you're in Ottawa, aren't you? Uh, Joanne. Oh. Enjoying decluttering and the squirrels that I'm following. Who else has a squirrely brain right at the moment? Mine is just flying a mile a minute. I have post-it notes. I have uh, notes on my phone. I've put up a whiteboard. I've got a bullet journal. They're just everywhere. The ideas are flying fast and furious. I'm going to have to have a whole debriefing session with myself when this decluttering's over to choose what great idea is going forward. I even woke up in the middle of the night the other day with an amazing quilt as you go quilt. I think I'm going to use it as one of my first stash busters this year. So lots of great things coming forward. Um, I am going to just grab one of the first questions. One of the people that are doing the declutter challenge want to know where the I'm in button is. There's nothing to down, like there's no official download or a file. What it is, is you go to the picture and if you're on a computer, you right click. If you're on a phone, you just put your finger and hold, hold it down and you save it from there. That's how you get the I'm in button. And somebody has asked, what is the difference between decluttering and organizing? Very good question because it's, I've said it before, it's like walking and reading at the same time. You think you can do the same at the same time, but truly you don't do either one very well. Do your decluttering and then do your organizing. And decluttering is getting out, is dealing with the capacity of your sewing room. So there's only so much space that you have, get everything out that you do not need. 
And then unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes you have to just choose your favorites, especially when you're in a small space. You have to th figure out some strategies for what can, what two items can I combine into one? And uh, okay, instead of three rotary cutters, maybe I just deal with, I just live with two and just figuring out which one's the best one for you. Um, some people are lucky enough to have big spaces, but then the trick as you move into organizing is to having the right tools and materials where the work is done. And I'm going to give a very broad um, example. Like if you had a warehouse and let's say there's 10 rows, if you only have one ladder, then you're, all, you're trying to find the best place for that ladder so that you make the fewest steps possible. But if you're like most quilters <laughs> and you've been quilting for a while, more than likely you have five or six ladders. And a lot of um, organizational people will say, put all like items together. But why would you put all your ladders in your warehouse in the one spot? The best place for a ladder is at the end of the row. It's where you're going to need it. So it's the same principle in our, in our sewing rooms, but that's gonna be in organizing, which comes after decluttering, because you don't know what you're going to be organizing until you, you deal with that capacity. Do you have enough space to move around and be functional before you figure out where everything goes. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> Shirley Monkhouse, glad to see you again. If you're wondering what these gloves are, these are just compression gloves, but I'm not actually using them now as that. I'm using them just to keep my hands warm. I'm in my studio space and once the sun goes down, the studio gets chilly. And if I was moving around, it wouldn't be so bad, but I'm sitting in one place. So I'm just using them to keep my fingers warm. Um, Shirley Monkhouse has asked, I want to start journaling to organize my ongoing projects. Aside from bullet journals, do you recommend any pre-prepared journals? How can you make sure that this journal doesn't become something to declutter later? Well, unfortunately, you won't know that until you actually check it out. Um, there's a, a couple of them out there. I mean, the obvious one is the Quilters Planner. They've been doing it for many years. Um, I think they keep refining it in some ways. And one of the other things that they have is they have a vibrant community and a, a year long project that people work on together. Um, but the downside to having something pre-made like that is that you have to keep up with it. And you have to, like, if you think differently or maybe you're working on projects differently or maybe you have a multiple different crafts that you're working at, on at one time, that may not be the best one for you. But it works for some people. So unfortunately, it's just a matter of testing it. Um, if you follow along with their community, you might get an idea what those pages look like. Uh, but I have always found that the bullet journal works better for me because I simply fall off the bandwagon. There's weeks that, you know, things just aren't working out right. Your dog breaks his leg or something like that. And life just goes to hell in a handbasket for a little while until you can get back on the wagon. And uh, I don't like all that empty space in, a, in the pre-made calendars. So that's why I go with the bullet journal. Sorry, just checking here. If that was somebody else. Um, Rose Layla Jensen has asked, I have so many patterns saved on my computer that I can't find anything. My gut tells me to print everything out and add it to my physical pat patterns. And then I go back to clear, then go back and clear them out electronically. What do you think? Personally, I think you should do the absolute opposite. Um, I think what you should do is, sorry, I'm just checking my husband's, <laughs> my husband is asking me something. Um, I think you should do the opposite. I think you should go through the patterns on your computer, relabel them so they make some more sense. I'm actually, tomorrow is the day that we deal with patterns, but my advice is to have one folder that you just dump everything in. 
You either relabel them or you make subfolders by designer or series, like it may be a blog club month thing, and go from there. And then I would make a list of them and keep them somewhere. Um, but you may still have the very same problem that you'll have with your physical patterns is that you won't make all of them. You know, only keep the ones that you're going to make. So uh, the ones that you have no intention of making or <laughs> you have no need to have a pattern for it or they're bad patterns, they're not well made. Um, those ones just delete. But don't add, don't add more paper to your space. If you haven't made it yet, the chances of you making it are slim to none. Yeah. Um, Gina Stevens has asked, I have a lot of different crafts and I have tried at the moment that I, I'm sorry, I have a lot of different crafts that I have tried at the moment. Should I continue to hold on to the stuff just in case I want to do more and let it go and focus on one thing? It comes back to capacity. It really comes back to capacity. I've got some beads in my, my room. Um, I do have a couple of balls of knitting, but I'm even questioning why I have that. I gave away all my crochet hooks to my daughter a couple of years ago because she took that up during COVID. Um, if quilting is your thing, if you've been doing it for a couple of years and you realize this is my thing and you can't remember the last time you picked up those other things, you make that call whether you want to or how much of it you want to let go. The truth of all this decluttering and the panic that we're going to give away something that we might need is that we can replace it. If, you know, five years from now you decide you want to come back to knitting, you can replace those knitting needles. You can replace those knitting patterns. It, you know, it's just about, we live in a different time. <laughs> <laughs> we have so much coming in and everything is easily replaceable. So um, there are some things with memory attached to it that you can consider differently. But again, it has to deal with your space. Uh, I carried so many crafty things around with me when my children were small thinking, oh, one day I'll make this. One day I'll do all these Christmas cards and things like that. I never had more than 15 minutes to rub together. There was no way or no place in my home where I could lay out anything for days at a time. So that day came <laughs> last year and I threw them all out. I held on for them for 25 years thinking one day I'll do it. One day I'll get into card making. One day I'll get into this and stamping and all those things. No, I, uh, they, they were in my decluttering last year. So that's me you can make your own call. And when you're also involved in some of these other crafts, you've got to remember that there's a lifespan of things too. Like paints are going to dry out. There's different things that will not be the same. Plastic will dry out um, uh, and get brittle. So, and colors will change too. So you may want, not want to do them the same way if you ever do get back into it. So I have learned, I really believe less is more. <laughs> but you do you, your space. Um, sorry, my eyes are just a little bit sore today. Uh, Anne Rankin, hello, Anne. Um, I love, she says she loves getting scraps. How can I, and you spend a lot of time sorting them. How can I keep them sorted when you're making a scrap quilt? Well, I'm not quite sure how you sort them now, but... Um, and it depends on the scrap quilt that you're making. One of the biggest problems with scraps is that they tangle and they, they fray and things like that. So if you do the cleanup of the scraps too early, they will just become a mess when you start to work with them. So my advice is don't clean them up until you actually need them. Because um, that's because you're, you're just going to end up having to re-clean the sides or um, resort them, depending on what your needs are. So with scraps, it's in my opinion, it's always best to keep it simple. 
if it's too complicated your system if you have if you sort by color and then you have five different sizes it will be hard it will be complicated <laughs> so it will be harder to keep organized and two it will be more overwhelming and less likely for you to do so try and keep it simple yeah <sighs> sue Thank you very much. <laughs> Sam Smith has asked, his, Sam's biggest squirrel is when the family needs them to help them with something. Example, making supper for the kids, helping husband with his woodworking. Do you have tips on time management when you have a family? Well, um, family time is a busy time and trust me when they're gone you're going to miss them so but it is important that you have time to recharge too and just be clear with your family that recharging doesn't mean leaving you at home while they go off to have fun and leaving you to clean up the house recharging is giving you time for your whatever it is that refills your bucket. And for us, it's most likely quilting. Um, you, you set boundaries the way that the kids do. The kids go off to do sports. You have your time to do what you need to do. Um, I don't know what you need to do to help your husband with his woodworking, if that's a craft or if that's his business. But um, if he's asking for your help, I think it should be reciprocal. And the same thing with the kids. Um, I think the kids can be in charge. I don't know how old your kids are, um, but your kids can um, be reciprocal and making supper for you one night. Uh, in my family, every Friday night was pizza night. That was a night when friends could come over, whatever, but I had my quiet time in the living room reading a book while they had their friends over we ordered pizza for how many people were at the door. Uh, and those are just happy memories that we have. So uh, I think there's a lot of different strategies that you can use that way. And you can also rely on family. One of the best things that my mother ever did was she made supper for my family every Wednesday night. And the kids would go over after school and I would have a couple of hours of quiet time to do whatever I needed to do. Often it was just just sorting, <laughs> just giving my brain time to calm down. Um, and then I would have a meal made. So re lean on other people. You know, it's a, uh, kids cannot take everything from you. You've got to be able to give yourself some time to fill back up. Uh, Nick, Nikki Bender has asked, how do you store large cuts of fabric? Well, it depends on how large you're talking. I think if you're talking anything larger than two yards, you, you look for to do it on a bolt of some kind. Um, I know with some fabric, they're stored on long tubes, but again, you've got to make them fit into your sewing room. So that's really not practical for a, a home application. Um, so I would go with bolts. And those cardboard bolts are thrown out by the dozen at um, quilt stores all the time. So maybe you give them a call and ask for one, but you can make them your make them yourself out of um, foam board or cardboard or all sorts of different things. So that's how I would store large, larger than two yards cuts of fabric. Um, Monique Poppystein, I believe. Pupplestein, sorry. Tips on decluttering the storage space of the sewing machine. How many feet do you keep? Well, that is a tricky one, isn't it? Um, how many feet do you need for your sewing machine? Uh, depends again on how, what kind of sewing you do. Uh, I think each one of my machines have about five or six. Eh, no, probably a little bit more. I think I may have 10 feet for each one of my sewing machines. I have two, my traveler and my home. Um, do I use all of them? No. Uh, the one at, the one at home is a more electronic one and it can sense when I have the right foot in and gets kind of cranky when I don't. Um, so I hesitate throwing them out, but one of my challenges for this year, it was a challenge for 
two years ago. Um, and then the world went to hell, but <laughs> I've got it back on my challenge list this year that I am going to try and use each one of my feet like a new one every month, see if I can incorporate it in a project. So um, if you don't use and never have used one of the feet, I would not throw them out because at some point you might upgrade your machine and you want to pass on all the accessories with it. So if you've seen my video, Organize Your Sewing Space Part 3, that's the type of thing that goes into your Zone 4 storage. That's nothing that you need close at hand. Get a tin or a box and put it in the back of your closet and you'll just know if something happens to your machine, that's where it is. And don't have them cluttering up that, that Zone 1 and Zone 2 storage because you've got too many. Just keep your best ones near and the ones that you've never touched. Put them in a tin and put them off to the side. Yeah. Lynn Stock Beringer. What can I do with all those 1980s fabrics I keep holding on to? They don't go with any of the current colors on the market, but I don't want to throw them away. I have a friend who has collected those 1970s and 1980s. I think she was cl collecting sheets and things like that in those beautiful color palettes. Um, well, the only person I can, I think there's other collectors out there that would have them if you're wanting to get some value from them. I know movies are being made all the time and they need access to those type of things as well. So there must be a source. I don't know where exactly you're located, but I would, if you just, if you just can't let go, then that's you. Uh, you know, don't keep them in your sewing room if you're not using them though. Again, that's something that should be, uh, keep it in a Rubbermaid container and put it somewhere out of the way where you're not tripping on it and where you don't have to access it very often. If you have not used it in three to four years, then it should be something that is up in the rafters or in the back of the garage or someplace not close um, because you should only have things in your sewing room that you actively want to use. So um, yeah, those are my, my two ideas. Look out for somebody that would use them or put them in a container and put them out of your prime space in your home. Um, sorry, <laughs> I think I do that every time. I, in between questions, I do this great big um and sigh. Uh, my Julie Morrison, 1960, my problem is how to declutter my brain. Too many ideas of what I could make with this and that keep popping up and oh, I like this block pattern. Realistically, I don't have all that time, but so much fabric to do all when I retire. Well, that, that brain, is, that scatter brain, <laughs> to use a derogatory term, but it's also called the visionary. And, you know, that's where all the innovation comes from is in that state. Your brain is just full of ideas and it's processing and they're all churning around. The mistake that so many people make is they think that they need to make a quilt out of every idea that they have and you don't. The idea... If you're worried about losing the great idea, write them all down, write notes. Uh, you think of Leonardo da Vinci with his uh, notebooks, all the different things he thought up that he never made. Uh, well, same thing. Keep notes, keep ideas, and you choose to make the good ones. Yeah. But don't, uh, don't worry about the, the squirrel brain. The, squir the only thing that you have to worry about when you have... Um, all these ideas popping in your head, you just need to be able to focus on what's important. So if a family member needs your attention, you need to be able to calm down and focus for them. Or there's other situations where you need some focus, but embrace the, embrace the squirrels. <laughs> yeah. Cindy... Cindy F. Mindy, I think is your, the name. Do you ever start a project and just don't like it at all? What then? In my decluttering, should I just get rid of it? Well, if you don't like it, 
then you should get rid of it unless it was made for someone in particular. If you were making it and that person wanted it and you are trying to, you're trying to follow through on it for them, um, then there's some other strategies you can use. You can work for 30 minutes at a time. You can change the design a bit. You can um, sort of shift the technique into something that you enjoy doing. But if you start it and you, you feel like you've just done it all wrong and you don't care about it, I would just put it in a bag and send it off to the... Um, Honestly, I would probably try to salvage something of it. Um, there might be a fabric or two in there that you like, and I, I might be salvaging those and putting them either in my scrap pile or back in my stash. But for the project that you do not like and you do not want, send it off to the donation bin. Yeah. Lesson learned. And I, I'm sure that every single experienced quilter on the list has one of those projects, especially when they start it. You just didn't know what you were getting in for. You saw something, you were influenced by something, and you, you <laughs> it's happened. It's happened to us all. Don't worry. Um, the third, sorry, one more thing on that is you can also make it smaller. Like if you've made three or four blocks, you might be able to turn it into a pillow or a wall hanging or a table runner or something like that but again where is it going to go if you do not like it who is going to like it so that's just one third possibility there healthy for you what do i do if i de if a declutter challenge item takes too long to do that is more than 30 to 45 minutes then you come back to it you do 30 minutes and then you do another 30 minutes another time, and you do another 30 minutes another time. So let's say you've got a huge um, book collection. You haven't gone through it in 10 years, and you've accumulated 25 books. Uh, sorry, let's say a bigger number, 100 books or more. And how do you decide which ones you want to go through? So if you had that type of situation, I would start with making a shelf of just your favorite books. The ones that if there was a fire outs and you had to save something, what were the, be the books that you would save? And put those on the shelf. And then the rest of them, I know I would, I would be going through each one of them going, ooh, do I want that? Do I want that? Do I want that? And there is some value in doing that. It gives you yourself maybe the the sense that, oh, I'm not throwing out the best pattern in the world that I forgot about. But at the end of the day, if you have not used that book in 10 years, the chances of, out of all those books, you going to that one and finding a pattern in it are very, very slim. So um, what's going to change? What's going to change to make you something that you haven't used for a long period? What's going to happen today, tomorrow, or the next day that's going to change your mind completely? Um, we've had the situation in the past two years where we can dig into our sewing rooms and why haven't you done it now? <laughs> if there was ever going to time that uh, you were digging in, it would have been then. And if you haven't used it, chances are you won't need to. So uh, some, th some things you just have to be brutal with, and that's why I use the shelf. What are your favorites? And put them on the shelf, and then is there a couple of reference books that you might want, or is there a couple of books that just have always made you feel good? But again, those would be in your favorites. So there's a lot we can do without. And if you've been quilting for a while, Again, there's this evolution of a quilter. Like you don't probably need a book on how to make nine patches because you know how to make nine patches now and things like that. And those things can all go. So yeah. just block it out. It, the, the, uh, every seven days we are going to have a catch-up day. So you can do it again on that catch-up day. So don't worry about that. And... La Pierre has asked. Oh, this is a totally, this has nothing to do with decluttering. 
<laughs> this is a binding question. Okay, I know you've done videos on binding. I've watched them and found them useful and have made myself the binding tool. Okay, so the question she has is, if the binding that we normally use does works fine, why would you do bias binding? It's complicated and hard to do. Um, the reason why you would do bias binding is if you need it stretch. Like if you were making a scallop binding or if your quilt had rounded corners or if your quilt had, um, you're doing a stripe and you want it to be more of a candy cane, that's when you would use bias tape now or bias binding. And there are people that have only ever used bias binding. Um, but I agree with you. It's complicated, but there's times when there's a design issue that bias tape solves. And she has a secondary question. If she's doing machine binding, is it better to sew from front to back or back to front? That again is a personal decision, whether you, which look you like better. Um, you're just going to have to do it a couple of times and you can make that call yourself. Yeah. <sighs> Gianthi Rayo has asked, I'm glad to see your, a question from you. Uh, how are you doing with your grandmother's stash? I know you inherited a lot from her. He is asking, I would like to know what is your take on solid fabric versus printed fabric and combining both? Do what your, makes you happy. Um, if you use a lot of solid fabric and then you use one printed fabric, it will draw attention to the printed fabric and vice versa. If you use a lot of printed fabric and you only have one or two solid fabrics, that solid has a little bit more impact. Um, if you remember my stash buster number four, solids can be really good when you have a line of fabric and there's sort of a gap in the value range um, or the color range and you can fill those in with solids. And solids are just less, ex in general, less expensive than the um, printed fabrics. So other than that, anything goes, any, yeah, anything goes. Barb Walter has asked, sewing scrap pieces, she's sewing scrap pieces to adding machine tape and she started in the middle, but the, her strips go wonky every time. Where are you going wrong? Um, you're going wrong in your pressing. Uh, you are either pressing to the side or um, you're not folding it over well enough. Um, and it's just, there's just too much play. You might also be pushing it when you are sewing. So you start that first little bit and it's not on the paper. And then as you go in, you're just not getting that, um, everything sliding around on you. You just need a little bit more control. And you can solve that by using a dab of glue, just um, water soluble glue stick. And that will help keep those uh, straight. Okay, we got a couple more. Oh. <laughs> it's amazing how fast time goes. I have just been barreling through the questions. I haven't even paused just to see who's still here. Uh, I've got uh, Fleur and Sarah and Zella. So yeah, is here. Hey there. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh boy. Look at everyone here from all over. I recognize so many of your names. Thank you so much for showing up. It is, it's just good. I, I'm just trying to be positive. It's going to be a good year and I've got some great ideas for us. So I'm, I'm just so glad that you're, you're here to enjoy them with me. And Lynn's so imperfect. You've been very active in my feed lately. I'm glad to see you're here. Oh boy. Anne Robles, thank you very much. And Fleur Madden, oh, Mary Ann Reynolds, I am glad that you are here. Glad to see how you, yes, okay. Um, jeepers, is there anything recent? There's um, not gonna be a weekly video this week just because there's so much going on with the declutter challenge. Um, 
and something that's different from last year is we're going to be ending with fabric. We didn't do it last year. I think I was avoiding it last year because I just didn't want to deal with my stash. But this year we're going to do it. So stay tuned. <laughs> so Brenda Holt has asked, show us how to make a quilt like this one. It's pretty and I like to try it. I think she's talking about the thumbnail. Um, and that w the thumbnail for this video is... Uh, an improv quilt that I made with raw edge applique. So I think the video is called Scrap. Raw edge applique and scrap fabric, I think it is. And I just did it just in the beginning of December, the end of November. Yep, I think Brandy might put it in the link in the, in the notes for us. Uh, Gay Laria, I hope that's how you pronounce it, sorry. Why has my je my last jelly roll fixed length quilt wound up with a huge curve? So I think what she's talking about is she has sewn all the strips of the jelly roll together and then it kind of curves on you. The, that's a couple of different things at play. One is the jelly roll strips are not cut perfectly on grain. And the other problem is as the, the two strips are going through your machine, one layer is going through slightly faster than the other. So what happens is it just begins to torque. And almost every sewing machine this, does this. One of the ways that you can prevent it is by instead of sewing all your jelly rolls going the one way, you just flip them around and sew them both ways, and that kind of can keep that torque at bay. But most of the time, it is easily ironed out, um, just depending on how bad it is. Some, uh, if it's just a, if your machine has been recently serviced, um, it should be easily ironed out. Now, um, the one other thing that can make that torque even worse is if you're pulling um, one of your fabrics. So a professional sewer, knows um, the, the rate that these two layers are going through your sewing machine and they may pull a little bit more on one than the other but if you're dragging on one and we see this a lot in um, anything circular if you've made a rope bowl or if you've made uh, a rug if you're not feeding that in just the right way you're going to get all these wonks um, this these waves in your bowl or your rug and it's just that very same issue with the torque in your jelly roll strips so you just want them feeding through at exactly the same rate now one other way that you can uh, fix it is by taking your finger and just kind of going along the edge of the um the stitch and kind of evening it out but it, it's often hard to do over 40 inches if it's just sort of 10 inches you might be able to to pull that out and release it a little bit just with a, a finger stretch but ironing probably is the best way to get rid of it <sighs> um, Debbie Moore Yip has asked when you're sewing blocks together and your seams are going in the same direction do you still nest your seams and have a twist or sew them in the same direction? I'm having difficulty picturing what you're talking about. But you do not need to twirl your seams unless you're working with more than four fabrics coming together. Um, what a lot of people forget is that your fabric is going, your quilt top is going to be going into batting and that batting is going to um, absorb a little bit of that bulk. So if it's anything less than that, I would not worry about twirling any seams. If it's a pinwheel, uh, then I would uh, twirl the seams. Danette Collins has asked, I have a bunch of completed blocks that I've struggled putting together and I've lost interest into sewing them into a quilt top. What do you do with those? Um, I would sew them quickly together. Well, as I'm saying that, I'm talking, I, I was going to say, sew them together and make a smaller quilt or just 
you some, uh, I've done this, I've answered this question several times um, in two videos. One, um, both of them have UFO in the title. I forget what the first one's called, uh, organizing your UFOs. And I think the second one is how to restart a UFO. And there's a couple of strategies that you can use for when you've lost interest in it. But you may not want to invest any single, any time whatsoever in finishing off that project. So put it in a bag and send it off to be donated because there's other people that will put them into quilts. But um, you can easily just polish them off and make a simple quilt out of them that can be just as beautiful. Yeah. Pamela Carter Wiley has asked, how do you fit how your how-to videos and interviews into your schedule and still have time to quilt? Well, unfortunately, the truth is I do not have a lot of time to quilt. <laughs> um, and in the past two months, we've had our dog with a broken leg that has taken way, way, way too much time trying to supervise. I've had Christmas. I've had my sewing room turn into a, a bedroom. Um, you know, there just has not been a lot of time to quilt. And one of the things that I'm constantly doing is trying to evaluate what project I'm wanting to work on and how I can make video YouTube videos from that project. What are what is the value that another person would gather from me working on this project? So that's where the binding videos come out of. That's where so many of the videos come out of is something, some project. And I find I can get really bogged down if I veer too far off what I'm wanting to do. Um, I'll have great ideas of, oh, this would be really helpful for people. And then because there's no um, overlap with my regular life, the videos end up being very hard to make. Um, but I'm trying to get more balance in it. Um, I have an editor that gives me um, a lot of time for the interviews and editing the videos there um, and a little bit of time for my regular weekly videos, but i am got to change the way I'm doing things so that um, I can get more help in that kind of editing. And I have to change the way I'm doing things. It just really comes down to that. Um, you want to hold on to things because you know how it ha has to look and how it has to be, but... Um, the reality is it just <laughs> takes away from my joy of quilting often um, when you, because every YouTube video has so many hours of editing in it. I know my videos are only 10 minutes long, but there's a lot of work that goes into that 10 minutes. So yeah, changes for, for the, the new year for me, changes. Yeah. And people often as, uh, approach me saying, I love quilting. I want to start a YouTube channel. And I'm like, then don't, <laughs> if you love quilting, don't start a YouTube channel because it cuts down. You think you'll be quilting all day long and it's just not that way at all. Yeah. Uh, Heidi Colden has asked, uh, parting with things is so hard. Everything has value and I hate giving things up. How do you part with things if even if they have value to you? We live in a strange time and my generation is kind of sandwiched between um, my grandparents' generation that grew up in the depression and my children's generation that lacks for nothing. Um, everything is easily accessible at a click and is delivered the next day. And we've not made any kind of adjustment for that influx. It just all flows in and we haven't figured out an easy way for it to flow out. And when we say value, there's a dollar value and then there's the emotional value because we know how hard we work to earn that money to get that thing. And then there's just the story that goes, that can be attached to those things. We can hang on to them and we can store them, but what's going to happen, like if you died tomorrow, what would happen to that item? Like, does it have any value for anyone else? So we get into, there's a whole, you can spend hours and hours and hours on this and trying to hang on to so much, 
but as I step into my stepped into my room this morning, my my quilting room this morning, and I could see the floor and my table was all clear. The payoff for that, that space, that luxury of space, you realize that decluttering really has a lot of value, a lot of value there. Like the space has value. And it's just our relationship with things. We have to alter the way that we deal with things. Um, I'm married to a man who not only likes to have backup, he likes to have a backup of a backup. You know, a friend of mine was talking about having a sump pump the other day and having a secondary sump pump with a battery backup. And truly, my husband even had a third sump pump just in case those two went. went. And, you know, do you really need all that backup? <laughs> <laughs> we have this paranoia that, well, what if I need it tomorrow? So if you have quilting stuff, if I get rid of a ruler, like let's, I have a variety of rulers and I'm looking right now, at, I have an eight and a half inch that I really like to use and I have a nine and a half inch that I, am I going to use one or am I going to use the other? Um, and can I get rid of one? And what's the downside? If a year from now I decide, you know what, I really want that other one back, how hard is it to get one? How hard? How And how hard would that hurt me? You know, so I could buy another one tonight. You know, I could have five tomorrow. So part of the, the thought in value and replacement and getting rid of it is how easy would it be to replace this? Like, I have a drawer of threads. Like if I get rid of half of it, how long can I sew for before I miss it? <laughs> you know, so it's part of value is replacement value, right? How quickly could you replace it if you lost it? Um, this week I decluttered an item that I got from Expo. Uh, my brother and I went to um expo in Shanghai. We were there on business and then we we had an absolutely glorious day. We had so much fun. We had two people show us around. We got into the back door of some pavilions. We just had a wonderful, wonderful evening. And I had this box thing. It was given as a gift um, by one of the people that we stayed with. And I was hanging on to it because that night that day that my brother and I had was so wonderful and but that's not where the memory is this box and the thing that I've received is just taking up space in my sewing room I kept the pass the ticket that got me in the door and that's all I need and I've got pictures and I've got stories to share with my brother I don't need to save the wooden box with the tchotchka inside it to remember that wonderful day. So that's my best answer. Um, but I do know how wonderful it is when you have the space to create and I'm not bogged down by all the other things. So um, We are at 6.50. 50 minutes have gone by. Boy, I can sure talk, can I? <laughs> I am so sorry, so sorry, but thank you all for being here. It's, uh, you've got me really thinking and talking and blabbing here. Um, any last one? I guess somebody has asked me, what is the quilt behind me? Uh, the quilt behind me is my epic after quilt. Uh, I made that video two years ago. On the front of it is my uh, Victoria and Albert quilt. These are our... Um, these are William Morris, William Morris fabrics from Moda. Uh, it was their pattern, it was a kit, and I made this side of the quilt with all the leftover fabric. So that's what that quilt is. And um, I think that's it. If you haven't watched it yet, I did a wonderful interview with Christina uh, de Miranda of Ships and Violins. She is a wonderful young designer. Uh, she is running the 
uh, CQA, that's the Canadian Quilters Association Mystery Quilt this year. Uh, she's hung at QuiltCon, and she's done a Quilt of the Month pattern for QuiltCon magazine called Badlands, and just doing some amazing things. So go check out that interview in Karen's Quilt Circle. And I'm trying to even to think of the last video that I made. I think it might have been that scrap binding video. Oh no, the last one was the rotary cutter. Ten mistakes, how to fix them. <laughs> and that's that. I want to take a thanks, thank you to So Yeah, uh, Marianne, Tammy Richardson, Linda Dubois, Mary Giant, uh, Giantonio, Carolyn, and Wendy. Thank you all for the super chat. And I, um, tomorrow we have the clutter challenge day number five. We are just about finished all the paper. Tomorrow's patterns, and then we have the archives, and then we have a catch up day. So I hope you're still in. Uh, I know we are uh, the initial burst of adrenaline may be burning off right at the moment, but just keep at it. Just keep that timer going 30 minutes at a time. Um, as we get deeper in it and we see some success, we think, oh, we're done. This is all we need to do. But if you can push yourself to the end, what we're trying to prevent is it happening again. Um, if it's really out of control. And the other thing is you may be avoiding getting to the, the hard ones like the UFOs, the kits in the fabric and that's where we're going. But don't worry, we're all in this together. Uh, there's so much wonderful support over on our Facebook page. Just wonderful community. What a wonderful group of quilters. I am just always feeling so blessed how supportive everyone is of everyone else and respectful. So um, join that, join in there if you haven't already. And that's it. I will see you next month. I believe our next one is, let me just see here. I believe our next one is on February 1st. Yes, February 1st at 6 p.m. is our next live Q&A. And of course, if you're a member of Karen's Quilt Crew, we will be having another Zoom meeting, not this Saturday, but I think I'm going to make it either for next Saturday, the following Saturday or the following Sunday. So I'll see you there. Love the crew. We have a great chat <laughs> once a month. And boy, again, wonderful, wonderful people. So um, I am going to call it. Thank you all for showing up. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.